find a Bible. If you don't have one with you, you can find one in the pew in front of you. We're going to get to that just a little bit later on in our text this morning. It's good to be back with you this week. Uh, When I'm not here, I miss preaching, and I'm uh, glad to be back with you this morning. Uh, Last week, we were at Camp Barnabas all week. Christy and I took a group of teenagers down there. They're going to share more about their story on August the 14th. So if you want to jot that date down, that's the day we're going to have. Uh, I'm not going to preach on that day. We're just going to have the kids sharing about uh, their stories. They have some great stories to tell. A great week uh, with, with the 10 teenagers that we took out there. I'd also like to thank uh, Bill Litson and Rob Fry for uh, doing the sermon uh, all the way back on July the 3rd. They talked about Nathaniel slash Bartholomew, same person. And then last week I'd like to thank Sally Barrett for coming and sharing about her mission uh, to Slovenia. Both of those sermons are online if you weren't here and you missed those, you can, you can uh, catch up that way. I really enjoyed uh, our study together about the disciples. It's been a lot of fun for me uh, to learn more about uh, each disciple. And I remember the very first week, or the second week really, uh, I covered Peter. And after that, someone came up to me during the first service, or after the first service, and they said to me, you know, I like learning about Peter, but we already know a whole lot about Peter. I can't wait to hear more about the disciples that we don't know anything about. So here we go. We're going to be getting into some of the disciples that we don't know a lot about. We've done that the last few weeks, and we'll, we'll keep doing that. But just to recap a bit, there are four lists of disciples in the Bible. And so if you're looking for the 12 disciples, you'll find them listed four different times. And there's different orders in the way in which they're listed. Uh, sometimes you'll see different names, uh, like, for instance, Nathaniel is also called Bartholomew. But there is consistency in that there are three different groups in all four lists, okay? So uh, you'll have the first list, and the first list is Peter, Andrew, James, and John. That's on the screen. I can't see the one down here, so I'm just going to flip this on if you don't mind. I think somebody turned that off after the service so I can see what you see. But in the first group, always listed in all four lists, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and In the second group, in all four lists, you'll have Philip, Nathaniel, sometimes you'll see the the name Bartholomew, same person there, Matthew, and Thomas. And this is kind of where we are now. We did Philip back on the 26th of June. Uh, Bill and Rob did Nathaniel or Bartholomew. Today we come to Matthew. Next week we'll do Thomas. And then the last list of four are the the least known. They're James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot. So you'll see that we don't know a lot about that list. In fact, we're going to spend one Sunday on three of those people, okay? That's how little we actually know about them. So we've covered the top four, and they are the ones that we know the most about, right? They're the famous ones, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And today, again, we are in the least or or the lesser known disciples. Now, again, if you've not been with us, let me encourage you uh, to go to the website and catch up on the disciples. So you might learn something as you go, and I think it'll build uh, kind of on the theme of the whole series if you are, are following along there. But today we come to Matthew. Now, as we've been studying the disciples, one of the things that sticks out to me, and it may stick out to you, is that they're extremely ordinary people. The disciples are not religious leaders. There's no priests who are called to be disciples. They're all farmers or fishermen or from some uh, occupation. Today we're going to get to uh, even a tax collector is in the list, right? But they're ordinary people. Uh, And we find that 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 really is a theme in the Bible, isn't it? That God uses ordinary. God uses the humble to accomplish his purpose. We see that throughout the New Testament. We see it back in the Old Testament. In fact, Psalm 113, I'll put this verse on the screen here, says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. We also read in Proverbs 3, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. We, we see this is how God works, isn't it? God likes to take the lowly and use the lowly for his purposes. But today, the lowly goes to a whole new level, let me tell you. As Jesus calls his disciples, again, he chooses the ordinary, he chooses the farmers and the fishermen, he doesn't choose the religious leaders, he doesn't choose the priest, 
And today it's very uh, intentional about the man that he's choosing today. And I believe that his occupation has a lot to do with it. Now, if you read scripture, you know that Jesus is not best friends with the religious leaders, right? You know that's the dynamic that's going on. In fact, many of the time, most of the time, Jesus is in conflict with the religious leaders. Now think about this, the religious leaders are the scholars. The religious leaders are the ones who know the Bible. The religious leaders are the ones who have been looking for the Messiah. They've been talking about the Messiah, they say that the Messiah is going to come, but when the Messiah shows up, they reject him. Think about that for a moment. Jesus is God in the flesh, and when Jesus comes, he's walking around, and he's doing some pretty miraculous things, okay? He's healing people. Again, people are blind, they can see. He even raises people from the dead. I mean, it's pretty dramatic sorts of things that he's doing. And it's not that the religious leaders don't believe in the miracles. I mean, they see them. They know that they're real. But Jesus threatened their way of life so much that even though they could see that Jesus was there doing powerful things, they rejected him. They actually said that Jesus' miracles and Jesus' powers were from the evil one. You might remember in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, we read, But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. You see, they were up front rejecting Jesus. In fact, I think that they knew that he was from God, but they were rejecting him nonetheless. Now, if Jesus would have just simply performed miracles and walked around, he might have been able to coexist with with the religious leaders. But Jesus pushes the envelope. Jesus continues to uh, threaten their power over and over again. And you can see uh, why Jesus did not appoint religious leaders or priests to be disciples. And you can see as Jesus comes to Matthew today, and he takes a tax collector, again, the most despised of all occupations, and appoints him as one of, the, one of his disciples. I mean, this must have been kind of a slap in the face to the religious leaders. So this is the story we're going to be looking at today. Uh, if you look at Matthew, I'll mention this because uh, you might get a little confused. You'll see this story in other Gospels also. In Mark, in fact, uh, we read he's walking along and he sees what? Levi, son of Alphaeus. You might go, wait a minute. That's Matthew, right? Levi and Matthew are the same person. Luke calls him Levi, and also in verse or in chapter five, verse twenty-seven. I'm sorry, Mark calls him Levi, and Luke also calls him Levi. After this, Jesus went out, saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at the tax collector booth. So we see him mentioned as Levi, but we also see him mentioned as Matthew in Luke chapter 16. When Luke names the disciples, he, in, he includes the name Matthew. And again, that might get a little confusing for some, but that's the same person as Levi. Also in the book of Acts, we read uh, the list of disciples, Peter, John, James, Andrew. You can see the order here. Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, not Nathaniel, but Bar- Bartholomew there. Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and James, son of Judas. And again, the last disciple's not there in Acts, right? We understand why Judas Iscariot's name is not listed there. But the name Matthew is probably a more familiar name to you and me than Levi. Why is that? Because one of the books of the Bible, in fact, the first book of the New Testament, is entitled what? Matthew, exactly. Now, Matthew is the Matthew that wrote Matthew, okay? Now, you might think that's kind of a no-brainer, but often we see in Scripture different uh, names here. But Matthew is the one who authors Matthew. So you would think, this guy is an author of a gospel, right? We probably know a whole lot about Matthew. You'd be wrong, because we don't know very much about him. We know very little about him. In fact, one thing we do know about him is that he's a pretty humble guy, because in his own account, he only mentions himself twice. He mentions his calling, and he mentions his name in a list. And that's all we have. That's all we know of Matthew. So the story that we're looking at today is really all that we know of Matthew in terms of Scripture. So let's look at this today. And let me, uh, before we dive into the text, uh, Brad's going to come and read in just a moment. Um, And I'll let you make your way over there, Brad. Let's talk about tax collector for just a moment. A tax collector is Matthew's occupation. And a tax collector... It is probably the most despised occupation in the first century. 
For a first century Jew, a tax collector was at the bottom of the list, okay? They were worse than the Herodians. The Herodians were Jews who had allegiance to Herod, okay? That's pretty bad, right? The tax collector is lower than that. They were lower even than Roman soldiers, okay? That's how bad the Jews hated tax collectors. Now, what were tax collectors? Tax collectors were people who had purchased the right to tax the people. So they bought the right from the Roman government, and now they have the full power of the Roman government and the Roman soldiers behind them to collect whatever they want to collect from the people. You can imagine, it was a pretty pretty bad deal. They would collect unreasonable amounts of money from people. They were the school bullies of the day, okay? If you saw a tax collector, you wanted to avoid him at all costs because he was going to take a whole lot more uh, from you than you were able to give, and he had the whole power of the Roman government behind him. No one liked tax collectors. So let me invite you to look at Matthew's own calling this morning. Brad, do you have verses 9 through 13 or 1 through 13? Uh, 9, 1 through 13. Okay. So go ahead and read verses 9 through 13, and we're going to go back and look at the first 12 verses in just a minute also. Go ahead. Good morning. The calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right. Thank you, Brad. So leave your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 9 this morning. I'm going to back us up to verse 1, because I think the story that precedes Matthew's calling is connected to Matthew's calling. Again, Uh, We read the first verse here. It says, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Now, this is probably Capernaum. Uh, Some scholars believe that this miracle actually took place in Peter's house. And by the way, if you're reading this account in Luke, Luke describes how they cut a hole open in the roof and let the man down. Do you remember that story? This is the same miracle here. Matthew doesn't, gives us, give us, give, Matthew doesn't give us the same detail. It says, Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I love this story. Jesus sees the faith of the men bringing the paralyzed man, and Jesus says to them, I want you to know... Your faith is strong, and I'm going to forgive your sins. Verse 3, at at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Now, they're not saying this to Jesus. They're saying it to themselves, okay? And and, and Luke, Luke says they're thinking it, but Jesus knows what they're thinking, right? They're maybe murmuring it over here. This guy's saying that he's forgiven sins. Who does he think he is? He think he's God or something? Right, that's what's going on here. Matthew, verse 5, which is easier, Jesus says to them, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. Which one's easier? Now, I could walk up to you, right? I could say, Mark, your sins are forgiven. Thank you, Wade, right? (laughs) Pretty easy to say, right? Now, do I have the power to forgive Mark's sins? No, only God has the power to do that. And there's really no way... That Mark could verify whether or not I have that power. Right? He can't say, well, all of a sudden, you know, now, now I feel different. There's no way for any of us to look at Mark and tell whether or not his sins are forgiven. So what Jesus is saying here is, look, you can't verify that. But what if I said to a man who is paralyzed, stand up and walk? Is that easy? Well, the obvious answer is no. That's a lot harder than to say your sins are forgiven. Look what, look what it says in verse 6. Jesus says, but I want you to know. That the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In other words, I want you to know. I just told these men that their sins are forgiven. And I want you to know that I have the authority to do that. Okay, I'm God, in other words, Jesus is saying. And how do you know that I have that authority? He said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now how crazy is that? How could the religious leaders respond to that? They don't, because there's nothing that they can can say to him about that. 
Jesus makes his point. Look at verse 7. The man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Jesus walked in and said, your sins are forgiven. They're murmuring about it. And Jesus says, you know, what, what, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or, or get up, take your mat and walk? Well, obviously the answer is, kill the paralyzed man. Jesus says, I just want you to know I've got the power spiritually to forgive sins. And I'm going to prove it by overcoming the power and the forces of nature. Get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. And everybody goes, whoa, this guy really can forgive sins. If you can make people walk who are paralyzed, then I'm going to trust what you say. Did Matthew see this? That's a good question, isn't it? Because it says here, as Jesus went on from there. So this happens right before Jesus approaches Matthew. Now, notice that Jesus sees Matthew. Matthew doesn't seem to be looking for Jesus. It's not that Matthew heard about this and he's seeking Jesus out. Not at all. Jesus sees Matthew, and it says in verse 9, where is Matthew? He is sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, that's a loaded phrase there. Matthew is engaged in sinful behavior when Jesus finds him. I think that's interesting, because too often we think we have to get rid of our sin and then come to Jesus, but notice Jesus goes to Matthew right in the middle of his sin. Where he's sinning, Jesus finds him. And again, prior to this, Matthew has seen that this man, Jesus, he at least knows about this, whether or not he saw it or whether or not he hears about it. He knows that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. And Jesus says to him, follow me. Jesus offers an invitation to Matthew. Leave the tax collector's booth. Walk away from your sin and follow me. I've got the power to forgive sins, okay? I just made a man stand up who couldn't walk. Now he's walking. I just proved that I have the power to forgive sins. Now, Matthew, you're sitting in sin. You're sitting at a tax collector's booth. Get up, leave it, and come and follow me. What was going through Matthew's mind at that point? You know, we read the text. and It's just so quick and so fast. We said, Jesus said, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. And we don't really think about what all was going through his mind. But maybe, maybe Matthew felt the weight of his sin. Maybe Matthew, day after day, goes to the tax collector's booth and he knows that something's not quite right about the way in which he's living. Now he's rich. He's got a lot of money. He likes that part of it, but something deep inside of him knows that it's wrong. And maybe Matthew is living under the guilt, under the weight of his sin. Maybe he knows if his life ended, it would not be good for him, you know? You ever had that kind of thought? Boy, if my life ended today, God would not be pleased with me. And maybe that was weighing on Matthew. Maybe he felt like God will never let me off the hook. I've done too many wrong things. I've hurt too many people. I've destroyed too many lives for God to ever show grace to me. I'm not sure what was going through Matthew's mind. But when Jesus walks up to him and says, leave the tax collector's booth. Follow me. Just imagine him. Reaching out his hand to Matthew. Matthew's got a choice to make. What's he going to do? He's going to have to leave a lucrative career. It will not be as nice and cush as it had been. But he sees the man who can forgive sins. Offering forgiveness to him. And Matthew takes him up on it. Matthew walks away from the tax collector's booth. He takes the get out of jail free card, if you will, okay? And he walks away and he leaves it and he joins Jesus. We continue to read the story. We find that Jesus then has dinner with Matthew. Now, to understand the dynamic in the first century here, if you have dinner with somebody, it's not just a nice meal. You're showing that you accept them. And so for Jesus to have dinner with Matthew is showing acceptance of Matthew. And not only... Did Jesus have dinner with Matthew? 
But Jesus also has dinner with all of Matthew's friends. Okay, look at verse 10 here. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Don't you love this image here? Jesus eating with the scum of the earth. Not only Jesus, but also his followers. I imagine them sitting around laughing and telling stories and enjoying each other's company. It's a beautiful picture here. The one who has the power to forgive sins is eating with sinners. Now, notice he's not condoning their sin. I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. Not that Jesus is saying, oh, the way that you're living is fine. Don't worry about it. But he's letting them know that they're not rejected because of their sin. That there's grace available for them. Even though they may feel that they don't deserve that grace, Jesus is accepting them while they are in their sin, offering an invitation for them to step out of their sin and to follow him. Now, if you look at Luke's account here, Luke is a bit more descriptive. In fact, Luke describes it as a banquet, a party. He is honoring Jesus. Luke is. Luke, Luke says that Matthew is honoring Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm getting the names mixed up here. <laughs> Luke's writing about Matthew, okay? Matthew doesn't describe it as a party, but Luke describes it as a banquet. And Matthew invites all of his friends to the banquet. Now, Matthew doesn't have any religious leader friends, okay? Tax collectors would not have invited religious leaders to the party. In fact, if Matthew would have invited the religious leaders to the party, they would not have come to the party, right? Because they separated themselves. Matthew's friends are all thugs, okay? Matthew's friends are all sinners. They're described as tax collectors and sinners in Matthew's account. Look at at what Luke says here. Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others... Who are they, right? Who are others? We're eating with them. Matthew's throwing a party. Maybe he wants his friends to experience what he's experienced. And Matthew invites Jesus. And Jesus Jesus doesn't go, well, you know... If sinners are going to be there, I don't know if I can show up. Because, you know, I would, I would be uh, portraying the wrong kind of... Me- Jesus doesn't say that. She says, sure, I'll come. Jesus sits down and eats with them. His disciples are sitting down and eating with them. Matthew, again, I think Matthew's telling his friends, you know what, this guy can forgive sins, right? I was in the tax collector's booth. I I didn't think there was any way that God would have grace and mercy on me, but he did. And that same grace is available for you. I, I, I bet that's what Matthew is saying there. So Matthew invites all of his friends. You know, if... Jesus would have been doing this in today's world. It would have been on the cover of a tabloid magazine, don't you think? Scandalous approach here. Here's Jesus hanging out with prostitutes, petty criminals, thugs, and the like. Right? It's really a scandalous situation. And somehow, the religious leaders find out about it. In fact, Matthew tells us that they saw it. Now, we're not sure how this worked out. I don't know. Maybe they hear the commotion. Maybe they have some spies, you know, looking at what Jesus is doing all the time. Uh, They look in. There's a party going on. Who's at the party? Wow, it's Jesus in there. And prostitutes. And tax collectors. And criminals. And Jesus is eating with them. Can you believe that? Word gets back to the religious leaders and look at verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They find out. They're outraged. They go to Jesus' disciples and they're, What's going on here? What's he doing? Is he crazy? Why is he eating with these people? What is Jesus doing here? As we think about Matthew... There's really not a lot that we know about him, is there? We don't have a ton of stories on this guy, but I think that the primary detail of Matthew's life is that he's a sinner. That's the point. Now, certainly all the disciples are sinners, right? But Matthew is really a sinner, right? He's a tax collector. He's a thug. And all of his friends are thugs. All of his friends are people that you would not want your kids hanging out with, okay? That's Matthew for you. And yet Jesus 
invites him. Invites him to follow him. Jesus' response here is also key in this text. Here, look at what Jesus says in verse 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Let this sink in for just a moment here. Do you see what Jesus is saying here about his mission, about his purpose? Jesus wants the religious leaders to know that he came not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. Well, people don't need to go to the doctor, Jesus says. Sick people need to go to the doctor. That's why doctors have a job, because people are sick, right? That's what he's saying here. Ray? If people had no car problems, you wouldn't have a job, right? (laughs) That's what it is. The doctors need sick people. The man who can forgive sinners needs to go and be with the sinners. That's what Jesus is saying. It might seem like a no-brainer to you and me, right? But to the church in 2016, we still have a hard time wrapping our minds around this truth. We have this idea that Jesus came for the righteous, right? Jesus came for those of us who have it all together, at least we, those of us who think we have it all together. I actually heard a preacher one time say, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Is that in the Bible? No, not at all. It's believed to have originated in ancient Greece. You'll find it in Aesop's fables. Some have said that Ben Franklin said this, but the Bible does not say this. George Barnum thought it would be interesting to take a poll. He's a Christian pollster, and so he polled Americans. And the question he asked is, does the Bible teach that God helps those who help themselves? Did you know that 53% of Americans strongly agreed with that statement? You see, this is the idea that we have, isn't it? That God helps those who help themselves. Now, certainly, the book of Proverbs does talk about those who work hard, those who are diligent, uh, God rewarding them. But the message of the Bible is not that God helps those who help themselves. The message of the Bible is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. The Bible helps those, or I'm sorry, God, <laughs> the Bible helps. God helps those who cannot help themselves. God helps those who are willing to say, I'm a sinner, I need mercy. That's what the Bible teaches. You see, sinners get that they're rotten, right? That's, that's what's wrong with those of us who are in church. We think we're okay a lot of the time, right? We don't understand that we're sinners. We don't understand that we are rotten, Right? We don't understand that we don't deserve the grace that God has given to us. And when Matthew hears Jesus say, follow me, he knows there is nothing in himself that deserves to be able to follow Jesus. But he responds anyways. And he leaves the tax collector's booth and he goes with Jesus. Look at what Jesus says to religious leaders in verse 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I'll put this verse on the screen. This is Hosea 6.6. 6. This is what Jesus is quoting here. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. What does God want? What does Jesus want? He wants someone who's willing to cry out for mercy. That's what God wants. That's not someone who says, you know what, I'm pretty good. I deserve God. It's worth mentioning that there are three different tax collectors in Scripture. I'll ask you to, um, I'll see how many of you went to VBS when you were a kid, right? The first one is Matthew, Levi. That's who we're talking about today. The second tax collector, does anybody know who he is? Come on. Zacchaeus, exactly. There's a little song about him, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. And as the Savior passed his way, he looked up in the tree. Come on. And he said, what? Zacchaeus. Come down, for I'm going to your house today. Do you remember that? That's the other tax collector in Scripture. Very similar themes to Matthew, right? Jesus calls him out of tax collecting and goes to his house. He accepts him. There's a third tax collector 
that's mentioned in Scripture. And I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 18. Just flip your Bibles over to Luke 18. I'd like to read this parable for you. It's interesting. Christy uh, was teaching Sunday school this morning, and she's teaching the, uh, the children kind of what we're learning about the disciples in worship. And she found a video clip from the, the new series, The Bible. I don't know if you've seen any of those uh, movies that are out, or I guess it's a TV show, or was a TV show, now on DVD. And it portrays Matthew. And in the movie, again, this isn't necessarily the way the Bible lays this out, but in the movie, Jesus is telling this parable that we're about to read here, and Matthew's sitting at the tax collector booth overhearing Jesus telling the parable. And when he hears the parable, tears start rolling down Matthew's face. Go look it up on YouTube. It's a great, uh, if you type in uh, the calling of Matthew in YouTube, you'll probably find that. Uh, It's a great clip. uh, And and the way in which, uh, kind of in a creative way, the filmmaker uh, brings these two stories together. But Luke chapter 18, let me read this uh, with you. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Why does God call Matthew? Why did Jesus call Matthew? I think he intentionally chooses Matthew because he's a tax collector. I'm sure that Matthew's friends, I'm sure that some of Matthew's friends also followed Jesus. You see, Jesus was often criticized for hanging out with sinners, right? He's often there with those who would be uh, coined as sinners. What does this mean for us? You see, God is not looking for people who can help themselves. God is looking for people who know that they cannot help themselves and are willing to throw themselves at the feet of Jesus. And I think this is the message of Matthew. Where do you find yourself this morning? Maybe there are some among us this morning who are still sitting at the tax collector's booth. They're living in their sin. And maybe you are there this morning. You're living right in the middle of your sin. You're thinking to yourself, there's no way God could ever forgive me for what I'm doing. There's no way God could ever give mercy and grace. I've hurt too many people. I've done too many wrong things. I've been, I've been in the wrong for so long. God could never forgive me. Maybe that's where you are this morning. You're right there. And you hear Jesus saying to you, follow me. Step away from your sin. Step away from the tax collector's booth. Follow me. There's forgiveness. There's restoration. There's healing. There's redemption. You, you don't have to face the consequences of your sin, Jesus says. I hung on a cross and I died for you so that your sins could be forgiven. How will you respond this morning? Will you follow Jesus or will you stay in the tax collector's booth? Let me encourage you this morning, follow the man who can forgive sins. You see, I don't think that Matthew woke up one day and said, man, I really wish I could go back to tax collecting, right? I wish I could go back into that life. No, Matthew felt the freedom of walking with Jesus and his life would never be the same. I bet if Matthew bumped into one of his friends on the street corner, hey man, it's been a long time. I haven't seen you for years. Are you still collecting taxes? I bet Matthew would say, no way, man. I don't do that anymore. My life is new and your life can be new too. And I bet Matthew would tell his story. In fact, I know that Matthew told his story over and over again. We have, in this series on the disciples, we've talked about what happened to the disciples. Because this is all we have. This is all we have on Matthew. We really don't know much about him. We know that Matthew, like the other disciples, ended up giving his life for Jesus. Uh, Most records indicate that he was actually burned at the stake. 
Think about this. The man who left a lucrative career in a scandalous occupation was eventually willing to lay down his life for the man who forgave sins. I'm not sure what God would be saying to you this morning, but we want to give you a chance to respond as the band comes. Maybe this morning, for the first time, you would say, I need God's mercy in my life. I, I need Jesus. And, and you would come simply and respond in that way. Maybe this morning there's some other need or some, some other way that God is pressing on your heart. The altar's open if you'd like to come and pray this morning. Or if you'd like to come and pray with me. You do that now as we stand and sing.